She has run the website Antarctic Glaciers since 2012 and has received a number of awards for science communication, including their 2022 Scar Medal for Education and Communication, as well as awards for the British Society of Geomorphology, Geographical Association, and the Geological Association. And I see Bethan's just joined us on screen. <laughs> Welcome, Bethan. Thank you. Um, second, we have Dr. Somas Mahaja, um, a geoscientist investigating mountain hazards, a member of the EGU Outreach Committee, and an executive editor for the Geoscience Communications Journal, as well as founder as a part, as well as founder of the Pause Quake Project an outreach initiative that aims to improve hazard communication with at-risk communities. Her outreach activities span nearly two decades of working with school communities across five continents, developing, testing, and refining earthquake education curriculum materials and addressing fatalistic attitudes towards geohazards. Finally, we have Professor Stuart Lane, Professor, professor sorry, of Geomorphology at the Institute of Earth Surface Dynamics, editor of the Journal of Earth Surface Processes and Landforms, and president-elect of the Swiss National Science Foundation Careers Section. Stuart has a particular interest in the making academia more sustainable, less precarious, and so more creative, which is why it has a long-standing interest in slow science. So to start, uh, I'd like to begin with Bethan, please. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you so much for the invitation to come. And I'm really sorry I'm not there in person. Um, I thought I would start with just a few reflections on outreach and social media. Uh, to me, outreach is about informing the general public about our research. And as geoscientists, we're all really motivated by societally relevant issues. We're always interested and excited to do research that has impact and meaning for people, whether that's hazard and risk or uh, resources or some other impact. Uh, my personal research is all about how societies will be impacted by glacier loss and sea level rise. Uh, so in terms of water resources, in terms of flooding, in terms of hazards. But most of this work that we do as scientists is quite inaccessible to the general population, even if it's open access and increasingly it is free for people to read. Uh, it's still difficult for people to access if they don't have a specialist education in our discipline. So it's really hard for me as an academic to read papers in uh, even kind of allied disciplines like igneous petrology or something like that. So these papers can be difficult to comprehend. And the bigger picture is often assumed because they assume the readership will understand it and know the bigger picture and it's not spelled out. Our reach is all about making our research findings relevant to a particular audience, uh, whether that's a local audience uh, who are impacted by a specific hazard or perhaps a group of people uh, who might use our end products. But it has to be readily accessible, understandable, and most of all, engaging. And I think that social media is an interesting option for our reach. And I was just browsing some of the 2022 Pew reports on me on how people use the internet, how they use social media. And something like 67% of American teenagers use TikTok and 16% use it almost constantly. A YouTube is still top of the social media landscape used by 95% of teens. 50% um, of American adults in 2022 got news from social media sometimes or often. And a quarter of US adults regularly get news from YouTube, as well as from Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, and others. So this offers researchers a huge opportunity if we can tap into that audience. And there's lots of different options for social media. There's many platforms and they all offer something different. So if you're particularly gifted at making quick snappy videos, then maybe TikTok is good. Um, YouTube offers slightly longer, more nuanced videos. Uh, Twitter is really good for engaging people like journalists and teachers who tend to use TikTok, quite a, uh, Twitter quite a lot. 
Um, Instagram is good if you're very visually talented. But for all of these, you need to take a very tailored and carefully considered approach. So you need to be really planning and thinking about how you can be most effective. And the reason for this is because social media is notoriously siloed. Um, people are in their circles, in their echo chambers, and it's quite difficult to break across those barriers. So we need to not just do this without thinking. We need to be thinking very carefully about our audience. Who do we want to engage? What do they know? Why would they listen to us? Why would they be interested? And that's where we need to be doing our research before we dive in. Uh, it's quite difficult to break out of that echo chamber. So you have to really understand your audience. Uh, and I think I think that's my opening. That's that's it for my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Bethan. Uh, now we move on to our next uh, speaker, Asomaz. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, great. So I want to start with three questions. Um, how many of you here know why earthquakes happen? What is the cause of an earthquake? Just show me a raise of hand. Okay. Most of you, if not all of you. Um, how many of you have experienced an earthquake in your life? Wow, a lot, a lot of people. How many of you have experienced multiple earthquakes? Okay, fewer, but still quite many of you. So I work with communities that are um, experiencing earthquakes quite often. In fact, so often that they simply sometimes don't notice them anymore. For one year, I lived in Tajikistan in the city of Dushanbe, which is the capital city. And every earthquake that I experienced, nobody else experienced. So I had to oftentimes go and talk to seismologists to make sure that what I was experiencing, the shaking that I was feeling, was actually an earthquake. And indeed, it was. So people become accustomed to earthquakes to a point that they live with them every day. They tend to ignore them. What is dangerous is that when I ask the same three questions that I ask you today of a classroom of students in a public school in the city of Dushanbe, the capital city, most students don't know why and how earthquakes happen. This does not mean that they do not have um, their own explanation of earthquakes. They simply do not have a scientific explanation for an earthquake. Most of them have experienced earthquakes before. Some of them have suffered from earthquakes before, have lost their homes, loved ones. So the topic of earthquakes and earthquake education is really, really important to them. It's sensitive information. And to reach this population and try to share the information that we have concerning hazards related to earthquakes in this part of the world, one has to be very, very careful with the approach, especially when dealing with a population who have all kinds of ex explanations for how earthquakes happen. And oftentimes these explanations are rooted in deep cultural, um, it has deep cultural roots. So I'll give you some examples. Um, I interviewed a number of students about the causes of earthquakes and many of them mentioned of animals moving inside of the earth because they were simply irritated. Now these stories are very interesting, they're fascinating, um, but it's, we can also really easily label them as myths or legends or even misinformation. It's very easy for us to get really excited about debunking these kind of stories. And oftentimes also in social media, it's really easy to do that or not even do anything about it, simply ignore it. But when we are dealing with a population who has deep um, uh, reasons for believing how earthquakes happen, we have to be incredibly careful. So there are three things that I want to mention today that um, are vital elements of doing outreach work. And these are important elements of the kind of outreach work that takes place outside of social media. But um, I think my colleagues here would agree that they're also very important when you're doing outreach on social media. But to be honest with you, I have a very difficult time uh, trying to imagine how we can achieve these three elements effectively on social media when we do outreach work. The first element, which is by far the easiest one, um, is dialogue. To me, outreach is a dialogue that you have 
with a population. It's not a one-way communication. It's not a lecture. We don't seek listeners and we are not going to be the talkers only. Um, and in fact, when you have dialogue with people, you try to, um, you start to begin to understand their perspective on hazards. And then it becomes very difficult to label them easily as misinformation that needs to be debunked. And that's very important. Um, when you have a dialogue with a group of people, um, you start to also build trust because you start to listen to them. So again, you are not putting the information out there and telling people this is what you need to know and this is what is really important, even if the information is accessible. If we are not going to ask them, what do you already know? What is your perspective? Even if we don't agree with their perspective, I think it's really important to create room for listening to people's story. And I will end um, my um, uh, introduction with an example, again, taking you back to the mountain communities of Central Asia, the Pamir Mountains. I uh, met a group of women there, um, and uh, we were simply talking about earthquakes and why they happen. And I asked them, what do you do when an earthquake happens? You obviously experience earthquakes here a lot. And they told me, well, you know, we have our homes and we have five columns, five wooden columns that are the strongest points of um, our building because they're named after um, each prophet. So in Islam, there are five very important pro prophets and each column is named after one of those. So we go and take shelter with them. We go and hold on to the column and we pray during the shaking. Now, if you have no understanding of um, where this idea comes from, you can easily label it as whatever you like to label it and simply say, well, they need to be told that this is really dangerous. They need to drop cover and hold on or maybe leave the house immediately. But when you think a little bit more deeply about why do they do this um, and talk with earthquake engineers, we actually figured out that these houses, um, they embed indigenous knowledge in them. They were built in a way that during a shaking, the walls that are around the houses, they collapse externally. So if the entire family comes to the center of the house and hold on to the columns, which are the strongest point of the house, oftentimes they um, suffer less injuries. And most of the time, people who live in such houses, they do not die from collapsed buildings or uh, items falling on them. So the reason I bring this up is to explain how it is important to have that dialogue to make sure that you're talking with people and listening to their stories and digging deep, asking lots of questions, building that trust and engaging them in the in the understanding in their understanding about earthquakes, not just science, but also the safety. And one last remark that I have, and I would like to maybe have a discussion later on this topic is that when we are engaging with people online, um, I think we do, we are encouraged and sometimes for a very good reason um, to choose not to engage with people. If you have a comment or a question that you received from an audience online via social media, you can choose not to respond to that. Um, and that's a good idea sometimes, especially when you are in an environment that is often labeled as a toxic environment where scientists can be harassed um, and all kinds of comments can make their way out there. So we can choose not to respond. But when you're doing um, outreach work outside of social media, it's very, very hard to disengage. You really need to engage with your audience, especially when you disagree with them. And again, dialogue and trust are a big part of that. And um, I hope that we can have a discussion mostly around those topics and figure out how do we actually can build trust, dialogue and true real engagement, the kind of engagement that is measurable um, doing social uh, outreach via social media. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... Well, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. I think I've been invited because um, I'm somebody who has on their door in my office uh, a statement, which is we are scientists, we don't blog, we don't Twitter, we take our time. Uh, and this is, for those of you who know anything about the slow science movement is, if you like, the mantra of the uh, slow science movement. And I'm quite interested uh, and this will be a little bit behind what I'm going to say now, 
uh, in what this means for the relationship between us, uh, what we research uh, and outreach, very much in the spirit of what Solmaz has said. Now, of course, I have to say at the start that social media is now an inevitable and normal part of not just life, but also academic life. And it, of course, it has lots of value. Um, there are lots of studies, some of you may have seen them in the journal Science and Nature, where people have reflected upon how social media has made the lives of PhD students potentially much less uh, isolated. You, it's important for networking, for creating communities. Um, it may even be the start of a reduced dependence on these great carbon costly meetings like the one we've all turned up to uh, this week. But I want to separate social media a little bit from um, uh, its role as a form uh, of outreach. Um, and there I think it is a question, not so much should we use it or is it to be used? It is going to be used. I mean, you know, not just Generation Z, but going well back to previous generations now, it is the primary way in which people access uh, information. And the question for me is, is not so much, should it be done or should we do it, but how? And that's where I want to make a few comments. Now, my first point actually uh, is um, what I call the Ponzi problem. Some of you may have heard of um, Charles Ponzi. He was an Italian uh, businessman who was famous for, for persuading people to invest uh, in a company. Then rather than using the investments to actually make a business producing something, um, he labeled that investment as profit and he used it to pay existing investors. So he recruited investors to pay investors. And it leads effectively and eventually to some sort of pyramid, which of course is and unsustainable because it can only survive as long as you can recruit uh, new uh, investors. And this is the very first problem of us thinking as individual academics and researchers about using um, social media for outreach. There are perhaps 15 or 20,000 people here at EGU this week. What happens if we all start to pursue social media as a means of telling us about uh, the results of our research. Um, effectively, we become our own audience uh, and it creates a false sense of impact, the perception that we're somehow reaching out uh, beyond our community when actually there are very few people who are genuinely interested in what it is that we do. Of course, it's quite laudable to pass on the results of our, our work through things like social media. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just that we need to think a little bit about the feasibility and the implications of this. Second point follows from that, and this is really the very different nature between the scientific outputs that we produce and the science that we do and social media. Sci scientific outputs are typically low in volume, most people will produce a certain number of papers per year, perhaps in the, in the tens or in the low hundreds. Um, and each of those has a relatively high and sophisticated content. Social media, of course, is typically low volume and very high, uh, uh, sorry, it's very um, high volume, but low content, large numbers of communications with actually relatively little content. This picks up very much on what Solmaz has said, is, is, is that how is it that we can somehow transfer trust in what we're doing and belief in what we're doing um, through social media? As scientists, we communicate that trust through rigor in our method, through exposing what we do to peer review ourselves by looking critically at what we're doing and trying to uh, improve it. It's that practice that gives us trust in what we do and it's very difficult to convey that trust through um, social media. Put it another way, why should someone believe what we say on social media when we don't also communicate why we believe with, that we can say it, why we, why, why we, when we don't communicate the basis of the conclusions that we're making? Or even put it another way, why should you trust a tweet from a scientist 
any more that you should trust a tweet from, let's say, Donald Trump? How is it that you filter those? How is it that a community and audience filters those uh, in what we do? In terms of navigation, how do we make sense of many tens, hundreds of, of communications when there's no synthesis, no integration, no distillation of key messages? And I was very interesting last week, and I was in a seminar where a colleague did a very good presentation talking about how in a warmer world, uh, we're going to be on average wetter, um, but at the same time, we will always have more droughts. How is it that in a tweet, uh, you can actually get that complex concept across, or in a series of tweets where it's only when you put them together and you synthesize them that you can start to understand uh, the essence of that contradiction. And of course, as we've already heard, I think Bethan has mentioned this already, that social media and how people use social media um, is very, very selective. Um, it's largely following echo chambers where faced with this large volume, and um, people choose the messages that they want to hear. So as when we put something out into the community, it's very, very unlikely um, that it will like, get to any other than those people who want to hear what it is uh, that we're saying. My third point is a question about what it does to us uh, as researchers. And the social media is largely a 24 hour, um, uh, seven days a week, 52 weeks of a year uh, activity. And if you ever um, look at what's happened to some of the major influencers on things like YouTube and so on, many of them have had serious personal crises because of the pressures that they find themselves under um, when trying to do the sorts of uh, social media use uh, that they do. You get exposed to criticism that can become um, obsessive criticism. It raises questions uh, of welfare. Um, and of course, as a result of that, to a certain extent, we have to think about what doing social media uh, as a means of outreach ourselves actually does to us uh, as individuals uh, and to our um, life uh, uh, and wider life and life experience. And that's really where I then make my, my last point um, is that for me, I don't think we can escape the importance of social media as a form of outreach. But the question is, should it be us? as scientists who are doing it. There are people out there um, trained in scientific communication. There are still master's programs in science communication. One of the things that comes from that, and very much the example of, of, of Solmas uh, illustrates this, is that communication, to do it properly, is a complex, interactive, two-way um, dialogue. And are we the people to be doing that? Are we sufficiently trained to be doing that? Do we have the time uh, to do it? And even then, are we even in doing it going to undermine the experts and the whole, the wider process of science communication who've been trained to do the communication for us? And so that really is, is, is my um, uh, concluding point that we can't escape the importance of social media in our day-to-day -day lives but we need to think a little bit about how we position ourselves with respect to that communication, who we ask to do it, do we do it ourselves, um, or do we uh, encourage others to do it for us? And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much to all three of our speakers. Um, now we will have a discussion on some of the points that our three speakers raised. And then we will also take some questions from the audience. Uh, there are two microphones in the um, aisle between the seats, and that's where we would ask you to ask your questions so that the people who are watching online can also hear what you're saying. Um, we'll have some discussion first, and then I will welcome some audience participation. So firstly, Bethan, I would like to sort of touch on some of the points that you raised with the statistics and the different types of platforms and social media that are out there. Do you use all of these? Are there certain ones that you favor for certain reasons? I think I think we can reflect on some of the things that, that uh, uh, Stuart Lane was, was saying. Um, I use Twitter. I don't use a lot of other social media, but I do use Twitter. And the main thing that I use Twitter for is to network and communicate with other scientists and other social media. 
uh, with other um, with other scientists and other journalists. So I'm not generally using Twitter to do outreach. I'm using Twitter to communicate with uh, science journalists, to communicate with professional organizations such as the Royal Geographical Society, with whom I do a lot of work, um, to communicate with teachers and teaching organizations with whom I do a lot of work. Um, but I do know that other people are using TikTok. So I can think of several people who are using TikTok to make engaging videos, short videos that are capturing people's interests and trying to break across the, the echo chamber or the silo to reach people who would perhaps not normally think to follow a scientist. And I think they are gifted how that creation of those videos. I don't think it's a skill that I have. Uh, I have used YouTube a fair amount to make some videos, mostly when I've been working with other people who enjoy video editing more than I do, and then they do the video editing. So I think when we are thinking about can we, you, can we do outreach on social media, mostly I'm using the social media to flag up more substantial outreach projects to other science communicators and to signpost people to them, but they are archived in other places, either on websites or videos or public events or something like that. Thank you. Then just to follow up on, on that point. So the way that you use social media is more of like a complementary tool to your other outreach efforts. So do you think that that is probably the main way that social media could be used for outreach as like a, an echo or an accompaniment? I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. I think if you look at who uses Twitter, for example, they tend to be adults rather than teens. They tend to be professionals. Uh, it's used a lot by journalists, academics, and that makes it a good way to interact with journalists. I don't think if you're wanting to reach an audience of, say, uh, I don't know, people who watch David Attenborough's Frozen Planet, and you want to te teach them more about sea level rise, it's difficult to reach that audience through Twitter. Um, but I think you can reach them through other, other tools. And I think just like there are many ways of doing outreach in terms of public festivals, science festivals, pint of science, soapbox science, I think you can use outreach in lots of different ways. And I, I think all of these different methods of outreach all have the same fundamental principles for success that both Salmas and Stuart have highlighted, which is about dialogue, understanding your audience, thinking about why you are doing this and how it can be effective, thinking about, you know, is this worth the time it's taken to do it? Great, thank you. Uh, Salmas, I'd like to ask you, um, we touched on a little bit there, different types of audiences, especially through, through Twitter, journalists, teachers, other scientists. What sort of audience are you aiming for? And are you reaching them in the only way that's possible or could it also work through social media? So I'm mostly working with school communities. So that includes students, teachers, school principals, even safety officers, um, janitors working in schools. So that's the audience that um, I'm generally involved with. And um, through almost 20 years of doing outreach in Central Asia, most of them happening in remote mountain communities. Yes, they do have access to internet. Yes, they do have access to mobile phones, um, but they are not on the kind of social media platforms that we often use, um, that most of you might be familiar with. And even their own social media platforms are not very popular. So it's not the question of access. They do have access um, to um, materials being posted on social media. It's just that they don't use it as to, to the same extent that maybe social media is used here. Um, that being said, um, putting the kind of information that I talked to you about, again, earthquake information might not sound sensitive material to you, but to a lot of these communities, this is sensitive information. Um, people, it's kind of like the topic of evolution in some communities in the United States. People get really upset or um, um, they get or very passionate about this topic when it comes up. So you can't just simply put out some information and says, you know, here's the hazard map of your community. 
this is the research we've done and we've figured out there's an active fault in your backyard and it's going to have an earthquake pretty you know in in the next you know so many years because it's it's due for an earthquake this information will not go anywhere even if it's put out there in the most accessible language um, because it doesn't really consider pe uh, people's ideas of earthquakes and in order to share you know the kind of information again that we would like to share with the community we first have to understand the kind of information that they have um, and in many communities when they see that you're listening to them and you're interested in their stories they also become interested in your stories they are the one that they come to you and ask you questions and not you going to them and say look check out this information this is really important to you so with social media that's really difficult I think to accomplish um, but when you are in person sitting in a room or outside or you know in a science fair or a museum and people come to you and you're there and you have time to really interact with them then you have more possibilities to engage with them and unfortunately you don't have this kind of possibility on social media I would say. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow up. So Simon, when he introduced you, mentioned the Parsquake project that you have, which is an education tool uh, online. It also has a Twitter account and some YouTube videos. So is there some additional value to being able to give enhanced visibility to these projects? Yes. So Parsquake was uh, founded in 2011 and only a few years ago, I decided to open a Twitter account for it. And the reason for opening a Twitter account was just also to get some experience with it, but also to share the kind of work we do with the greater community, because we are producing all kinds of content that other communities could potentially use. Um, but it's we don't use the uh, the account to really like use it as an outreach in a sense that um, when we put this information out there, we expect you to engage with it, and we actually can measure that engagement. For me personally, it's very important to be able to assess the impact of the work that we do. And with social media, I find it often very difficult to assess the impact of the work that you do. And when you cannot assess that and you cannot measure the success of your work by meaningful parameters, um, how do you know what you've done that actually has a good value to it? This is very difficult and um, it's also very um, unmotivating for someone like me. I need to be able to see if what I did actually worked. If the, if the information that I wanted to convey was received in the most meaningful way. And I also want to see that what people do with that information afterwards. And when you work with people that you can keep in touch with and keep in contact with, you are able to trace that. Whereas with social media, I think that's very difficult. I'm, so, I'm sure some people here have some ideas for being able to trace that, but it's much more challenging, I think. Thank you. And Stuart, you mentioned in your introduction about publications being very thorough, um, deeply scientific. And when scientists are writing those there for other scientists to read, do you think then that if we were not to do some form of outreach, that that would be even a smaller audience that the science is actually reaching? Yeah, so let, 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 me, let me be clear that, that outreach is important. And we have a duty to make sure uh, that the results that we're, we're producing um, are indeed shared in an appropriate manner. Um, some of that, uh, requires us to think of other other ways of doing science. And actually, I think that, that, that Somaz's example is a lovely one. Um, in the need for outreach uh, in with a with a community disappears as soon as you actually do science with that community. They've acquired the knowledge that it is that they need to have in order to live with whatever it is they're living with. There are other situations where what we do um, has some benefits. Uh, it's more a case of how do we actually get that outreach to happen. Um, and my argument will be we must perhaps avoid circumventing what you would call the normal channels. Now, those normal channels are not um, always the right ones. I mean, I, I happen by, by chance, we had a paper published yesterday uh, which looked at bias in the way climate change is mediated uh, in um, the newspaper, in the news media, uh, and largely the news media picks up upon catastrophe, 
which is exactly the wrong thing to pick up upon if you actually want people to believe that they can do something about climate change and psychology the psychologists part of the paper actually show their own so there are problems with other kinds of outreach as well and um, for me the the root problem is is that a lot of what we think is is really interesting um and uh worth communicating is the sorts of things that that people wonder uh, what on earth is it that they are telling me about now yet another uh forecast of a catastrophic collapse of the west antarctic ice sheet for instance that is probably going to happen as a catastrophic collapse but whether or not social media is the right way to get that kind of message and learning across for a very complex topic is a is i think a debatable point thank you and just following up on that do you think there are certain topics of science which should be communicated via social media and some that should be only communicated in a more traditional sense um yes i mean it, it, and, and it may actually be so much is better to, to co comment on that i mean there are certain situations i mean some will will, will, will remember the the earthquake in central it italy about 10 12 years ago and the problems that then were were posed to scientists who are accused of not having done their job properly because of their failure to communicate. So we do have a responsibility to communicate. Uh, the question is much more, what is the best vehicle for, 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 for by which that might be done? Uh, um, and, you know, as I said before, that, that my, I have a fairly clear belief that, that, for, that reaching publics, we need people who are experts in communication. Um, there are some scientists who really can do that they know how to communicate and they know the broader issues around communication but for the vast majority of us we're not trained in that at all that's where the care and caution i think is needed do you want to mention anything about follow up no no okay uh, Bethan, then I would like your input sort of on the last point that was just raised of, of really who should be doing this outreach. Should it be left to someone like a social media influencer or should it be scientists? I think I think there's one thing to quickly highlight, and I think I do tend to differentiate between impact and outreach. I tend to view impact work as something that will result in changed behaviors, changed management strategies, changed uh, an adaptation or a different way of doing something. Outreach may just be telling people about your project, about your work. So if you've published a, a paper on, on a topic, it may just be about trying to encourage people to have access to that information, uh, whatever that information is. Um, so I think it's, I think it's important that we think about that, and I think there are uh, ways in which we can do outreach on social media. Uh, I think the new video sharing things like TikTok can be extremely effective. Um, it's a shame that the other panelist wasn't able to come because they're they're very good at this, um, at making very accessible videos that do have scope for nuance and that do enable people to engage with your work. Um, I, I tend to rely more on websites and blogging and written media because I prefer writing to, to video editing. Um, I don't know if that counts as social media or not, but that does give you scope and nuance to explain things in an accessible way, to use figures and graphics and, and words, written words. And I think I just wanted to pick up on one thing that, that Stuart Lane said, which was about this idea about leaving this to the experts and relying on science communication experts. I think part of the problem is there's there's not enough of these people and they tend to work for organizations uh, like museums or uh, science organizations like this. Uh, and it's difficult to get your particular work in their field uh, so for example if to think about the example of the west antarctic ice sheet one of the reasons why i was motivated to write uh, a website about the antarctic ice sheet was because i saw so little information online about what the threat from west antarctica actually was what was this thing about marine ice sheet instability i kept seeing it 
mentioned in press releases when people published their latest nature paper, but it was hardly ever explained in an accessible way. And that was the motivation for writing the website. And the science communicators, the professional science communicators, there aren't enough science communicators and they don't have enough free reign to communicate all the science that we do. And I don't think we can just leave it to them. But I do agree with, with, with Stuart that this isn't for everybody. Not everybody should be expected to do science communication. But if we do do science communication, it's important that that's recognized as academic work and an, a valuable contribution. Thank you very much. Solmaz, I would like to hear what you, your opinion is on this, because you are firstly a scientist and a researcher, but very involved in, in outreach. Is the time that you spend on outreach something you consider as research or part of your academic role? I do, but it has not been a smooth path for me. It's been quite bumpy. And it's been also difficult to convince others around me that this work is valuable and should be recognized. Um, so from the very beginning that I started outreach, thanks to my graduate advisor, who had very little background in outreach herself, but she could see the value of outreach. Um, but she told me the only way she's going to support me financially um, and uh, emotionally to do outreach work is if I make it as vigorous as my scientific work. Meaning not to just say, look, you know, I just go and give a lecture on earthquakes and why earthquakes happen. Maybe show some animations that are engaging and interesting, but so what? You can go to a YouTube video and watch some animations of that or it, it's, it's just nothing interesting about it and you yourself don't learn anything from it. Um, so from the very beginning, um, she encouraged me to publish on the work that I was doing and taking it very seriously and always having a question or a series of questions in the back of my mind that I was going to investigate as part of my outreach work. Whether or not I made it visible to the people that I'm working with was another question. Oftentimes these questions were just in my own head. And um, I was uh, working with people, giving lectures, getting their feedback, collecting information. Um, and then later trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? Was this outreach work meaningful? Um, so yes, I do put a lot of time into education and outreach. Um, I am very interested in that. I do see that as part of my uh, moral duty, especially for someone who works in the field of geohazards to do outreach work. Um, if other people and other science communicators can join the effort, that's really great. That's wonderful. But I think we as scientists, especially those of us who are working in fields that are societally relevant, we do have this responsibility to reach out to the general public. But um, as many of you mentioned here, we oftentimes don't have those skills. So we have to focus on giving those skills to future scientists and also creating lots of opportunities where you can hone those skills, where you can practice. I had lots of failure um, in my uh, path of doing outreach, but every failure was, um, was a lesson to learn. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart, you mentioned in your, your introduction about being in the age of miscommunication and fake news and this idea of having a false sense of impact that scientists have. Do you think that some science outreach through social media is actually negative or impactfully bad for science? Um, I think that... The actual out, outreach, the messages that science send, is it, it's rarely bad on, on its own. I think the problem is what happens to it uh, when it gets into a system over which you have very little control. So you make a statement, uh, it starts being retweeted, people start putting their opinions in, and it takes on a life of its own. And before you know it, the actual message in the paper has been completely uh, changed. And it's been very funny watching what what happened to the university press release in relation to this article about mediation of climate change i mentioned earlier in the last 24 hours uh and now the uh the the online discussion sites have lost all relevance and link whatsoever to the original article in terms of what they're saying not just about the topic but about the article itself and this is the problem we have with this kind of social media um 
it, 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 its strength is its weakness. Its strength is it can reach lots of people. It can get people motivated to 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 read and to comment. Um, but actually, uh, quite rightly, in a democratic uh, system, uh, there's actually very little that you can do to 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 constrain what where the debate and the argument is going. To have a serious dialogue that says, "No, you've misunderstood that." You get the the noise. Uh, uh, that, that develops around it means that your signal as a scientist gets very rapidly diluted and lost. And that I think is actually then quite serious for science because it allows people to sit in their echo chambers uh, and not to get challenged by the, the results that the science, the science has, has, has achieved. Of course, in going back to the debate that from, from, from both Solmaz and, and, and Bethan, that impact is still important um, and outreach is still important. The question is, is whether... Uh, that kind of impact and outreach is, is the one we should be aiming for. Um, I wonder if part of this is also sort of the responsibility of the scientist versus the responsibility of the general public or journalists, perhaps, to then make sure that they are transmitting that message correctly. Is is there something that we could do as scientists to to better make it more responsible for everyone to communicate better? Yes, I mean, I'm very, very sympathetic to, to Bethan's point about the, 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 the lack of science communicators to, to help us. I'm also acutely aware of what happens when you go to many communications officers who have a very clear idea of what it is they want to communicate, regardless of what you've done in your research. Uh, and actually, that itself is another challenge, which is how we relate to other kinds of systems. So yes, I think that's a very fair fair assessment. And Bethan, if I can just ask you sort of the similar similar point here, you mentioned journalists as one of your key audiences that you you speak with on Twitter. Um, how have you found sort of using Twitter to mediate that relationship between you and journalists? Uh, I have enjoyed using. Uh, social media and Twitter to engage with scientists, with, to engage with journalists, and there's a lot of journalists on social media. Um, and you can either reach out to them when you have a paper that has been published that you think may be of interest, or sometimes when they have a paper that's got an embargoed press release on, they reach out to you to comment on the paper. And I think that that can be mutually very satisfying. But I am also aware that often, although I think most journalists are very, very keen to get it very right. They're also often quite short on time. And some journal, some journalists for certain newspapers may have more scope or more uh, ability to focus on the, uh, on the science the, than others. Uh, some are basically reprinting the press release and asking you to comment briefly on the press release, whereas others will write something a bit more nuanced. Um, but Stuart is right in that you don't then retain control over what's published in the resulting uh, news piece. Uh, they may use your quote or use your comment, but then uh, they'll probably ask some other people or uh, maybe go off in another direction entirely. Uh, I think most journalists are very keen to faithfully reproduce the science, and that's why they have engaged with you. Uh, but sometimes there can be time constraints on the ability to do that. So it sounds like you have quite a lot of engagement, um, sort of going back to what Solmaz mentioned in her introduction, that sometimes there can be a lack of engagement on social media because you can just not respond. But have you found that you're quite keen to respond with everyone or are there certain uh, people who you won't respond with, for instance, climate change deniers? Uh, I don't tend to find it particularly constructive to get into debates with climate change uh, people who are sceptical about climate change uh, occasionally have been drawn in and my response is usually that uh, it doesn't tend to result in a productive conversation and they're unlikely to change their mind no matter what I say because their response to any point being refuted tends to be yes but this and they just come up with another point uh, so I tend not to uh, engage in these things and I tend to just withdraw from the conversation and block them if they are being rude and harassing me. Thank you. Solmaz, um, you mentioned this lack of engagement on social media and have you 
you, can you just sort of um, advance your point a little bit on why you think it's important that we have this two-way dialogue? Um, let me just be clear. When I say lack of engagement, it doesn't mean that there is no engagement. In fact, when you talk to people who do a lot of outreach work on social science, they do use the term engagement a lot. And there are papers trying to measure engagement on social media. Um, what I have, what I struggle with is the, what we call engagement, what we define as engagement. For instance, on social media, the number of clicks that you make on a certain, I don't know, um, video, this could be counted as you're engaging your audience. Like how long have you stayed with a video? How, how long of the video have you watched? How often maybe you return to the video? These all are quantifiable, but do they really truly show engagement? And what do we mean by engagement? And in the kind of outreach work that I do, um, I guess I can de demonstrate that by giving you an example of the kind of engagement that I'm looking for. So I had um, one student in my class, and this student um, is a representative of a, a large group of people that I've actually worked with, um, who was one of those students who told me earthquakes happen, you know, because we do have these animals inside of the earth, and, um, and oftentimes these animals move around and then we get the shaking. And um, I had asked her that question, and that was her response. And I only listened. I didn't make any comment on that story. I just, I just said, "Oh, that's that's really interesting. I didn't know that story, or 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 I, I heard it from someone else." And then um, this was the beginning of the workshop that I had with with the students, and this was a three month long workshop. And um, I had an earthquake education curriculum, both focusing on the science of earthquakes, but also safety. And uh, we never returned to that story that the student told me or many other students told me. We talked about uh, plate tectonics, plate motions, faults, seismic energy, about earthquake safety, what do you do, how do you prepare? And then at the very end of the workshop, after three months, we had focus group discussions where students would come together, we would sit around a round table and we would talk about earthquakes um, and what they learned, um, the stories that they have, I'm, I'm generally really interested in hearing people's stories. And this girl who told me at the very end that, um, yeah, you know, I, am, I, I was talking to my neighbor and my neighbor told me, oh, why did you come back so late from school? And she said, oh, I'm attending a workshop on earthquakes. We're learning about earthquakes. And the neighbor, the neighbor said, well, you know, um, why are you learning about earthquakes? The earthquakes happen because we have these animals. So the neighbor repeated the story for this girl and she was telling me in that focus group that she told her, you know, that I don't think uh, there is uh, the earthquakes really actually work that way. Um, there are plate boundaries, there's plate tectonics, plate movement. We can actually see where these plates come together. And she had a satellite imagery, uh, actually an ocean bath bathymetry uh, map that she was showing the neighbor and says, we can actually map these things. We can actually see these earthquakes happen here. We can record earthquakes. And, uh, and the neighbor was like, no, no, but there are animals, you know, it's the shaking of the animals. And the girl says, okay, but show me, where are these animals? You're talking about anim animals inside of here. Have you ever seen them? Like, what is your evidence? And she was saying this in a very cute, you know, funny way, but it was this girl challenging her neighbor um, without me ever have, having uh, forced to step in and telling her, look, the story you told me, it's just the story. Look at science. I never had to tell her that. She had she made this transition by herself, and she's just an example. There were many other kids that had stories, similar stories like this. And this to me is 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 is, is impact. It's something that okay, maybe I cannot quantify it by a number, but I can see that this girl took the information, did something with it without me ever telling her that the story that she was telling me was something wrong and something that she should just put away and not think about it or tell people that it's the wrong way of thinking. So it seems like as with many aspects of science, it sometimes is about quality rather than quantity, but perhaps we focus on quantity a little bit too much. Um, I would now like to open the floor to some questions from the audience. Also for our online audience, we're moderating and checking the chat. So please feel free to um, put your questions in there and then we will get to you. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? Please. Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so I recently started my PhD in climate extremes and I'm quite eager to kind of get involved with science communication and outreach and stuff like this. 
Um, but one kind of point, I mean, you mentioned a lot of interesting points with kind of how, yeah, the nuances of how it can go well or bad. But one thing that I'm also a bit hesitant about is the fact that often these um, platforms like TikTok or Twitter are like also a completely, like they really get you hooked and you <laughs> end up wasting a lot of time there very easily. People go on there to be entertained, not necessarily to learn. And I was wondering like how to balance that. Like if I wanted to start making short TikToks, I could really see myself also kind of re-downloading TikTok, ending up being on there all the time or Twitter, like saying that it's outreach, but then actually just like, uh, procrastinating my actual work so I was just wondering if you had any inputs on that Beth and maybe you can input that yeah um I have I have some thoughts um firstly I think I think uh Somas's uh, efforts are extremely laudable but I think they are very time intensive and I think uh they're a big part of her job I think what social media can be quite effective for is is reaching a large number of people by making kind of bite-sized digestible uh, social uh, clips on social media or on blogs or on websites. Um, I think uh, a major topic like climate change is something that people are really interested in. If you highlight, if you ask and survey a bunch of young people, sort of 16 to 18 year olds, a lot of them will list climate change as one of their top concerns. And so I think there is a lot of desire and a lot of interest in this on TikTok and on social media. And certainly that age group are using uh, those, that social media quite a lot. Um, and I think highlighting uh, the key headlines, lots of people emphasizing, lots of people giving the same key message that climate change is important, that this is going to have a big impact. And also perhaps highlighting simple things like simple things we can all do can be really, really effective. So, for example, when I survey uh, people, when I speak to people, a lot of them think that they are making big environmental um, changes because they don't use plastic straws or and they use a reusable coffee cup but they have a lasagna with beef in and then beef burgers uh, maybe two or three times a week they're eating red meat and they don't realize how significant the carbon footprint is of this kind of red meat it's not something a lot of people are that aware of uh, so a lot of people putting out similar messages about climate change about simple things that we can all do about eating perhaps more plant-based, about limiting our flying. This can be really relevant and useful. Uh, so I think that can be quite effective. In terms of uh, managing your time to manage it, um, I think you can be aware that TikTok can be quite, and other social media can be quite addictive. And I think you just have to be disciplined and try and make sure that you're not spending too much time on it. And that is something that you can discuss with your supervisors and your, your mentors as well, to make sure that you're managing your time appropriately and still meeting your academic uh, requirements. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, thanks. Great uh, panel. So I'm one of these uh, Twitter users. And one question for you, Beth, and first. So we all know uh, Space Karen, aka Elon Musk, has taken over. And this thing has become a bit of a cesspit for all sorts of toxic shit. Sorry for not uh, having any better words for that. So what's your recommendation to do with Twitter as a scientist who's using it? And for Stuart? quite controversial, as you probably know. A um, couple of points. So certainly I agree on many of the points. I disagree on a couple of aspects where at least I, for one, have definitely different experience. And one is that most of my science knowledge, like outside of my field of expertise, I gain from colleagues who I trust, who I know I can trust on Twitter, on the social media. And that then gave me the opportunity or the skills, so to speak, to also learn in a completely different uh, area of, of research, which is like virology or epidemiology. So we all were completely confused. And having those skills then gave me 
access to these scientists in a completely different field. And obviously their input was like absolutely most valuable compared to everything you can, can uh, get on the media. If you get the skills to actually uh, evaluate it for yourself. And one extremely good example is kind of namesakingly sitting in the room. This is uh, Simon Clark, the other one, the YouTuber who I happen to know from Oxford. And if you have seen his videos these days, they are like on fleek. They are absolutely perfect. And certainly reaching now to an audience, it's way beyond like the usual scientist's Twitter feed. Um, and I think you can only get there if you are a scientist. And certainly you need some passion. You definitely need a bit of talent. He all has got that. And here's your really good point. He also struggled with mental health really badly before the videoing. So that's probably just a part of it, perhaps personality related to who gets into video making, who doesn't. Um, but he was also open about that and probably learned his fair share. And I will conclude by saying, I guess I learned my fair share. All the colleagues I have been following over the years, years learned their fair share. And I'm not sure whether science communicators actually do the trick because they might become just journalists and then like, you know, fall uh, into the same traps all our journalist uh, fellows do. So how can we teach scientists to become good communicators? And I guess that's my question. Thank you very much. Shall we take Bethan's response to your first question about Elon Musk first? Yeah, I, I thank you. I think it's an interesting question. I see a lot of uh, colleagues complaining about Twitter and leaving Twitter. My personal take is that I tweet as long as it's useful to me and when it's no longer useful to me, then I'll no longer use it. Um, I tend to try and curate a more positive timeline by either muting or unfollowing people who are persistently uh, negative and then anybody who's rude to me gets blocked because I have no desire to, for people to be rude to me. So I just, I just don't engage and I block them. Life's too short to engage with rude people, in my opinion. Uh, I currently find Twitter fine. I don't find it particularly um, uh, difficult. I think there's a lot of uh, airing of discontent on Twitter. Uh, and so sometimes if I get fed up with that, I might not use it for a while. Um, but I, I try and deliberately curate a timeline where people have a bit more positive, following people with a bit more positivity. Great, thank you. And Stuart? Yes, I can respond to both of those questions. I mean, the, the, fir the first point I would say is I fully agree that there is an important function for social media. But I think I said this at the beginning of my, my little introduction uh, as a tool for um, building academic communities. And I think we've seen that through COVID, that, 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 that social media was one of the ways in which we were able to live with the fact that we couldn't go to meetings, that we couldn't physically meet people. Personally, I hope that um, these kinds of communicating will lead to more sustainable research practices. The fact that we don't feel a need to get on an airplane two or three times a year to go to meetings, that we can find other ways of building communities. And that's this notion of trusted colleagues and trusted exchanges. So I'm fully in, in, in agreement with that. And my criticism of social media is not at all about social media as such. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really a call to think more carefully about how we use it in communication um, and, and outreach. And I think the second point, I would thoroughly agree with you. Um, there are, without a doubt, scientists, and I, I'm actually Bethan, I think is a good example of one of these extremely um, talented at using these kinds of tools to good effect. Um, most of us, I suspect, even with training, uh, wouldn't be. Um, and we need to always ask ourselves, okay, is it worth, and this goes back to the time question, is our time best spent uh, on social media, or is our time best spent looking at realizing impact from our work in other ways? I mean, I'm a good example in that, in that um, a lot of my work is concerned with um, degraded water environments in, in, in alpine regions. Um, and there, if I have a finding, I go to a member of parliament and I ask them to make an interpolation uh, in government. And that has actually resulted in changes in our water law. And that's another way of realizing 
outreach, another way of realizing impact. And that I think just really emphasizes is that there are no real rules and we shouldn't have rules here. It's about finding the kind of, of outreach that suits you, knowing that most of the outreach that we do has both advantages and disadvantages. Thank you very much. I think we had another hand. Yes, please. Um, I think there is a confusion here, at least for me, uh, and that's the difference between science communication and outreach. So personally, I see science communication uh, as communicating about our recent findings, which are usually sophisticated and sometimes, uh, you know, cutting edge. Uh, they're not well established, maybe. So the public, uh, you know, audience do not have any idea about that. And then I can agree with most of your points that social media is not a good place for science communication. But I see outreach as talking and communicating about the uh, public or more basic uh, aspects of, of our research, our, our knowledge. And those are usually well established. So my question is that uh, from, from panelists, whoever wants to answer, do you see any difference between these two or uh, no, you think they are the same? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Solma, seeing as you are both on the outreach committee and an editor of the Geoscience Communication Journal, I think you're probably best placed to answer this question. So if I put my editor hat on, um, with the communication, we include outreach. So when we say, you know, for instance, geoscience communication, it can be anything from educational activities that you do with schools or higher education to any kind of other outreach activities in museums, science centers, smaller communities, including social media as well, as well as policy work, citizen science. So. Science, communication itself or geoscience communication encompasses all of these things. Um, personally, I don't really make a big dis um, distinction between these two terms, science communication and outreach. For me, both of them are communication and even better, both of them are a kind of dialogue that you're having. Now your audience could be different. You could be having that dialogue with the members of public, or it could be if you're having that dialogue with uh, members of your own community, your scientific community. I don't make a big distinguish uh, between these two, as long as I remind myself that both of these are a dialogue that you're having. Um, it could be a different kind of dialogue, of course. You use different terminologies and a language, but nonetheless, it's a dialogue that you're having. So I wouldn't really get um, so picky with words here. Would anybody else like to comment? Yes, Bethan. Well, when I talk about Antarctica and the challenges that we face in Antarctica, I periodically find people confusing sea ice and ice sheet. Uh, this is appearing even in, you know, well-regarded uh, uh, newspapers, um, but it happens very commonly in, in the social media that people get very confused between ice sheets, sea ice, icebergs, uh, um, floating ice, grounded ice, land ice, and you can see that they find it very confusing. And so I, I agree with the question, I, I couldn't see who they were, but I agree with them that um, it's very difficult to explain the nuances of why there is a threat of climate change in Antarctica when people haven't fundamentally grasped the difference between floating ice and grounded ice and how they behave differently and why they're different. And so I think there is a need to communicate this science in a way which however you're communicating it that is relevant to the audience that you're trying to reach. And so if you're trying to speak about the importance of your latest finding, your latest paper on subject X, it's really important that you understand your audience and you think, well, but do they actually know why this is important? Have they grasped the fundamental principles of this uh, before you provide the kind of high, the high level details? So I think that's a, I, th I think, it, I think I, I agree with, with, with Somers that they're, they're kind of similar and they're kind of related because it's difficult to communicate those finer details when people haven't understood the fundamental basics. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions online or 
No, just, you have a question. Good, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm not sure being a co-convener of this uh, great debate, I'm allowed to ask any question or not, but if it is, then uh, it's an open question to to the panelists, uh, but before asking that, I, I must say uh, it's, an, it's an interesting uh, debate, and I, I really enjoy throughout uh, the, the discussions against or in favor, but uh, the, the question is, um, as we have heard a lot about uh, loads and loads of uh, science uh, communications through Twitter or just tweeting about the papers and uh, new research of individual researchers. Uh, uh, the, the question is, do you think that there is an ethical issue uh, a researcher should follow uh, before putting something on Twitter that, I mean, I, I have so many publications in few years and which one I should uh, share with the Twitter audience or which one I should skip just to avoid these loadings. And if it is the case, what, for an early stage researchers like me as a PhD students, I really want to publish every, like share whatever publication I have. And I feel if I do that, that can, you know, expand my opportunities for the next adventure of postdocs. Maybe someone will pick one of my papers and become interested to, to take me as a postdoc. So, that, so that's, the, that's my question is, is about the ethical issues of preliminary scrutiny before putting into the Twitter. Thank you. Do we have anyone who wants to Stuart? Yes, I mean, I think there is a deep problem uh, in academia, um, which through my other work, I've been actively involved in fighting against, um, which is judging people by not simply the number of times they get tweeted, but things like the number of times they get cited, rather than the quality of the work that they're actually doing. And so there is a deep problem in, in you know, citations now, we are producing so much as uh, scientists in terms of journal articles that you see a growing tendency for researchers feeling they've got to tweet about their latest paper in the hope that someone will read it and cite it because they know that in some competitions, it's going to be the number of citations that will determine how people perceive the impact of that paper rather than the quality of the work that's in the paper itself. And so this is where social media is bound up with a deeper problem, a deeper structural problem with how we determine what quality uh, is. And as we said earlier, uh, I think it was Beth who made this point, the importance of thinking about quality uh, and not uh, quantity uh, is there. That said, I think that, that the notion that you can say something about the paper you've produced and, and let your colleagues know you've produced it is actually a service um, when it's done in the spirit of letting people know there's something interesting out there for them to read. But when it becomes a device that people have to use in order to get their work read and cited, then it's reinforcing a much deeper problem that we've got in the academy. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask a second one to, to Stuart? Stuart, uh, if someone doesn't use Twitter and if uh, the researcher wants to share the, the research, is there any alternative route? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know, you could, there are publishers have all sorts of ways in which you can harness uh, that. You can share your paper uh, you can email your colleagues. I mean, there are other ways of doing it besides Twitter. Twitter is indeed an efficient way of doing that. And that's why I do think social media uh, has some role as, a, as, a, as an academic community building um, tool. I think it's actually quite important, as do other platforms as well. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just that we mustn't lose sight of what actually matters here. It's the quality of what we do uh, yeah. in, in our work. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, we have another question from the audience. Yes, uh, I have a question for Bethan. Uh, um, I was wondering, um, I have quite a couple of friends and family who are unwilling or uncomfortable in discussing climate change, for example. If you do that then on social media, to force that upon them, how do you deal with that? Uh, I think it's quite difficult to force social media climate change on people because uh, they just scroll past you or ignore you if they don't want to discuss 
whatever you're discussing. They just say, I'm not interested. Um, and if they have that mindset, it's unlikely to be successful engaging with them and they're unlikely to want to listen to you. Um, so it's not like when we do outreach, we tie people up and enforce them to listen to us. Um, this is exactly what Summers was saying about having a dialogue, about respecting people and listening to what they have to say. Um, so I, in person, would never insist on talking to someone about a topic they found uncomfortable. And on social media, it's not really possible to force people to listen to you because they can just ignore you and scroll past you if they're not interested in what you're saying. If the question is more about how we can engage people who are not interested in climate change, um, I think that's that can be very challenging. And I think there it has to be mostly about listening and listening to why they are skeptical and trying to understand where they're coming from and then trying to meet them halfway, trying to understand their backgrounds and why they are struggling with this. So it is less about saying and, and more about mis uh, more about listening in that kind of in that well in every in all effective science communication it's, it's a lot about listening but it's particularly important there okay thank you thank you yes yeah um we heard a lot of, a lot of things what we can do but can you give some insights in the things that we should not do uh in social media uh yeah, an outreach. Stefan, do you want to suggest some things? Uh, yeah. Uh, the first thing that I never do on social media is uh, reveal personal information like my address, my car registration number. Uh, I don't uh, show family members. Um, I don't uh, put out personal information. I worry about keeping myself private. Um, I try not to put too much uh, personal emotion in. So if I'm feeling particularly unhappy, I, won't, I, won't, I don't think that's a good day to be on social media. Um, the other thing that I always do, uh, that I'm, the kind of other rule that I follow is to try and be respectful and to be um, polite and civil on social media. And I think that's really important. Oh, I does also, the, other, the final thing to remember is most employers will have a line in their contract about not bringing the employer into disrepute. And it's very important that you don't post uh, something that might bring the employer into disrepute on social media. Um, and I think the best thing is to not tweet when you're angry about something and not to use social media if you're angry to, to vent or to rant. I don't think it's the place for that. And you might get into trouble if you do. Thank you. Um, so much, or, or Stuart, I'm just wondering if you have examples of what you shouldn't do for your types of outreach. I think I um, mentioned it during the examples that I gave. Um, when you hear something that is completely wrong coming from the person that you're having a dialogue with, um, just doing our best not to let that impact the rest of the conversations we're going to have and just continuing to ask questions. I think, um, or not asking questions and just continue listening. I think this is, this is really important. What is um, I advise not to do um, when you're doing outreach work, um, especially, especially in communities that have very strong opinion about the topic, is to walk away. Um, it's the easiest thing one can do um, to say, well, that's what you're thinking, good for you. I'm gonna go, you know, live my life. So it is a very easy thing to do, um, not exactly in the way that I explained it, maybe a, a bit more politely, but there is something to this even politeness of saying, thank you very much, I leave, that is very impolite, depending on the context and the people that you're working with. Um, so oftentimes, even though when everything is telling me, leave this conversation and be, go away with it, I try to stay, um, and ask questions um, and try to see if I can find um, some points where we can agree on. Maybe starting with focusing on shared values and then from there, continue the conversation. But uh, that would be my advice. If you can manage not to leave the conversation um, and even maybe you're not contributing to the conversation, but being there and listening, 
I think it's a really good thing. Um, and just simply being humble and uh, not always wearing your scientist hat with you, because even though um, it's a nice thing and most people trust scientists, data shows that, um, I think it's sometimes nice to take off your scientist hat and just be a person. And, um, and you will be amazed oftentimes that will open up lots of space for conversation. Uh, yes, I, I would say two things, both under the banner of don't let it take over. Uh, and we've already heard about this. Um, don't let it displace doing the research itself. And I was very worried uh, a few years ago in an Institute Away Day when a, a PhD student said, um, I think he was a bit off the cuff to be fair, um, oh, we, we're not going to need to publish our results anymore. We can just share them through social media. Uh, and I think that that's actually uh, a serious misunderstanding of what actually matters in academia. And then the second and related thing about not letting it take over um, is I would strongly encourage you to see this, see whatever kind of mediation you do as part of your day job done within your hours, your normal working hours are not something that you allow to extend into the evenings and the weekends, however dynamic the conversations might be, because I think that there are serious mental health consequences, and particularly if these sorts of communications get um, difficult or unpleasant. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Uh, oh, online. Can, yes, please. And then we'll come to you. Okay, so we have a question on Zoom uh, asked by Caroline. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the great discussion, uh, referring to asking questions and listening. What is the best way to do this on social media? And often when reading over comments, there are often many negative comments. How can you take away meaningful information that you can work with to better your science communication? Okay, who would like to answer that one? How to better science communication. Bethan? Um, I have a, a website and the website has a comments facility and people often comment on the articles. And the comments are uh, ranging in tone and um, the ones I have a screen and if you're I have a rule and it's my website so it's my rule and the rule is if you're rude to me then your comment doesn't get posted um but there's uh, often a lot of comments on a similar theme and when I see a lot of comments on a similar theme I realize that this is something that is not particularly well understood and so that tends to maybe guide me or inspire me into producing my next article or in producing my next outreach so for example uh, I mentioned that people often misunderstand the difference between sea ice and glacier ice, grounded ice, ice shelf. Um, and I have many, I see this repeated very many times. And rather than responding to each individual person, because there are so many, uh, I have put a lot of effort into producing resources that answer this question thoughtfully. And then if I have the inclination, I can post people, refer people to that resource. Um, so these kinds of uh, comments, uh, if they are persistently confusing something, then that can inspire me into producing uh, something that might challenge it. Um, if they're if they're negative and, and personal, then I think they're just trying to muddy the water, and they are, they might have a, a motive. And if they're unkind, then I I think this it's not worth my time to engage with them. Great, thank you. One more question from the audience. Hello, thank you for the session. So I have a question, maybe it's already answered a bit, but so I think social media, I mean, it's, it's, it's specifically suitable to like show your uh, life, right? That's what a lot of people do. So there's like videos on uh, how to make food, how to make, how to do your makeup, how to make music. Uh, so why should we post a scientific information, right? That's not what it's uh, about. So I was wondering, should we not, as scientists, uh, focus on the, the life 
uh, aspect of it and the process of uh, doing science. So, you know, uh, the methods, the failures that you have, uh, how overwhelming EGU can be, uh, which is, uh, you know, more the human aspects instead of like this new paper and the main findings, which is more science communication. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, Stuart? Uh, yes, I actually fully agree with you. Um, trust in knowledge is generally something that comes from doing it. And there's actually quite a large literature in the history and philosophy of science that shows that we as scientists believe what we do because we've done it. The best example of that is mathematical modeling of environmental systems, where we learn to believe our models, not because they simply reproduce data, but because we've played with them, we've learned to manipulate them in the way you learn to interact with the game so that you trust that the game is going to work in the way that you want it to. Um, now, how on earth do we communicate that is the question, given if, if what we believe about the science we do comes from the very practice of doing it, we have to think more about how we communicate practice. And it's true that, that whilst I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a, somebody who, who looks at YouTube particularly often, um, some of the most interesting videos you see on YouTube um, are uh, not actually about what we found, um, but things that we got wrong stories where scientists basically say, I made a mistake, and this is why I made a mistake, because that reveals so much about the nature of science, in particular, the very best of what scientists do, uh, and, and which effectively is when we're critical, when we're skeptical. Um, and it's always a great irony for me that we have climate skepticism being uh, alleged that scientists who are inherently and implicitly skeptical bunch of people but they still believe in climate change. And so, so that, that how is it you get that practice across, um, I think is where there is actually some interesting um, possibilities for communication. So your idea of a cookbook type of videos is, is very interesting. Great, does anyone else want to respond to that question? Uh, Bethan? I think there's a lot of I think it's, I think there's a lot of different ways to do science communication and to do outreach. Um, but I think one person who does it very well on TikTok is someone called Peter Neff, who's an ice core scientist at the University of Minnesota, and he's on TikTok as IC Pete. And I really encourage everybody to go and look at some of his videos, which have had hundreds of thousands to millions of views. And some of these videos, most of his videos are about um, ice cores and a lot of them are of him in the field taking ice cores sometimes they're simply him throwing a block of ice down the ice core and listening to the amazing sounds that it makes and just highlighting you know this is an ice core this is what we do this is what they look like this is how we get them and there's a lot of as well as talking about kind of what the data shows he's also showing how he obtains the data so he's melting ice cores in the videos or um, walking around a milk murdo for example and I think I think it's uh, I think that's really interesting watching. It's obviously very engaging due to the number of videos that he gets, and it's it, he really gets a lot of interest and debate from from the viewers. If you look at the comments underneath, um, and I think, but I think there is a lot of interest in the scientific life. I think there's a lot of interest in what is a conference, what have you learned, and I think if you were inspired to talk about this on social media, I'm sure people would find it interesting. But I think. To reiterate something that Stuart said earlier, that you know, there's lots of different ways to do outreach and science communication on in various platforms successfully. And if you want to talk about the ways in which we do science or what it's like to be an academic at a big scientific conference, I think people would find that interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now only ten minutes till the end of the session. Uh, we perhaps take one or two more more questions, Nas. Uh, sorry for asking another question. This is not from the chat, it's my question. Uh, so when, when you talk about TikTok uh, as, as a tool for social media, uh, like science outrage, I think I, I have a feeling that it is easier for natural scientists, like uh, going to the field in a mountain, take a video about ice core or glaciers and put it on, the, on tw Twitter or TikTok. But what about the social scientist, like social geographer or a sociologist who wants to do the science communication? Do you think it's uh, 
they are lacking behind uh, in terms of using those uh, social media facilities? Stefan, you're shaking your head. Um, so I'm a, I'm a lurker on TikTok. I don't really post, but I do follow lots of people and there's all sorts of interesting people doing social science. Um, I watched a really interesting video the other day and he, the guy was just walking along a river chatting about stuff and uh, being really insightful and making some good points. And so I, you know, I think it's about what you say. It's about being engaging. And I don't think you need to have the ability to go to Antarctica and drill an ice core to make an engaging video. I think if you're doing social science or desk-based science or computer modeling, you can still make engaging videos about that. And actually, someone who does that is Doug McNeil. He makes engaging videos, but they're just him in his living room talking. Uh, and I think they're really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thomas? Just to add to that, um, for social scientists, uh, if they are um, focusing on collecting data with people, um, for instance, um, recording a conversation, uh, it's really, really important. Of course, it goes without saying here that um, the person you're interviewing should agree that this video is being made and they should know how that video is going. To be. What happens, unfortunately, especially in many of the communities that I've worked with, is that visiting scientists who are conducting field work in these areas, they come and they take images, photographs, video recording of people um, either doing, in, involved in some ritual activity or getting their opinions or thoughts about the topic um, without their permission and without making sure that they have a full understanding of why that video is being taken. Um, and even though those people will probably never see that video again, um, somebody somewhere is going to see that. Uh, without the knowledge of the person who was being videotaped. This happens a lot with people, um, the communities that I work with. So if you're a social scientist or a scientist um, and um, you're producing those kinds of imagery videos, um, please make sure that um, you clearly communicate um, why you're doing that with the person who is involved in it. Okay, um, I would now ask each of our panelists for the last few minutes just to summarize the actual question of this great debate, which is, is social media outreach? And I'm going to start with Stuart. All right, I have to think quickly. Um, is social media outreach? Um, I think social media can be outreach. Um, I think um, there are certain um, scientists who are sufficiently able to be imaginative and creative to make it outreach. Um, I think it would be quite wrong if we thought about it uh, as only the only sort of outreach, um, which wasn't really the question, or whether perhaps more to the point, um, uh, it's it's the sort of outreach that will displace other kinds of well-established forms of outreach. And it will be a real shame if we lose some of the um, other and often more obvious ways in which we can actually lead uh, or show that our research or make our research have impact. Social media, if it's done well, I think takes an awful lot of time. It might suit some people, but but I'm not sure that it actually really is right for most of us. Thank you. Salmas, the same question. Um, I think doing outreach on social media is incredibly difficult. Um, again, by the standards that I set when I do outreach outside of social media, um, it's incredibly challenging. The landscape of social media is very complex. Uh, the way I see it compared to when you are in a, in a community and talking with people, not simplifying communities, but I think when you are on social media and putting out any information, you don't know who is going to receive it. You don't know how people are going to react with it. You actually really don't truly know your audience. Um, and um, for me, that's, that's a struggle. Um, when I when we, I think we all can agree here that knowing your audience is really important. What what does that actually mean? Know your audience, um, because oftentimes when I talk to people, they say, "Well, this is geared towards general public." What is general public? The public is not general, actually. Pu public is very very diverse, and even when we say this talk is geared towards general public, it's incredibly vague for me what that means. So, um, so it's it's social media outreach. Um, yeah, maybe it is a formal outreach, but it's a very complex, very difficult um, kind of outreach for me. If I look at it with the view that I have um, doing outreach outside of social media. Thank you. And then finally, Bethan. 
Um, I think Stuart said it well when he said it can be. Uh, I think using social media can be quite helpful to a lot of us. It can help us build our network, can help us reach out and connect with not only other scientists, but journalists or teachers or particular audiences, policymakers and stakeholders. Uh, I sometimes review who follows me on Twitter. And although there are lots of scientists who I know by name or who I've met in person, there are a lot of other people who I who I don't know who are journalists or uh, other people. Um, so I think social media can be. I think if you're interested in it, then it can be. I don't think it's something that we should all feel that we have to do. But if you're interested in getting involved in doing any kind of outreach and you haven't got a lot of experience, then social media can be a really good way to start. If you're interested in doing more TV work, then YouTube and TikTok can be a great way to gain experience and to learn about how to speak to people, how to make engaging videos. It can be a great way to reach out and network with people. And when we were talking about publications earlier, I'm always excited when I've published a paper and I just want to tell people about it because I think it's exciting. It's nice to have paper work published and it's nice to tell people about it. So I think it's a great way to kind of share your work and tell people what you've been up to and what you've been doing. Uh, so I think it can be outreach. I think there is a vast literature uh, and a lot of research that has been done. And so if you were interested in using social media for outreach, then I would encourage people to start reading that literature and thinking about what they're doing and how they're going to do it. But I think if you're interested in social media, uh, if you're interested in outreach, which I assume most people in this room would be, then if you want to do it, then have a go. Thank you very much. I now hand over to Simon. So yes, so we are scant on time, so we need to bring this session to a close. So just to quickly thank the audience for their questions and for attending the session. And also thank our panelists, Salas Mahaja, Stuart Lane and Bethan Davies for their insights. Thank you.